That spirit lives strong today in the activists and freedom fighters who are fighting against the authoritarian state, each in their own way, each with their own mission, united for the cause. had the idea to run on a platform of fuck the police prior to actually winning the primary. I mean, AOC is a drama queen and she's full of shit. They said, you don't get to tell us no, we're in the state health department, and I said, hell no. You brought a freaking guillotine. People already pushing back in ways that didn't even need any votes to be cast. I'm not ratting on anybody, and I did what I did, so you're going to have to give me what the law says you have to give me. You want to make the world a better place? Have some babies, and raise them to not be stupid. Hope I don't get canceled. Talk to you. These are the people whose stories I'm here to share. I'm Justin O'Donnell, and this is Submersive. Man, governments are not going to like this shit. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, activists, anarchists, and people of the internet, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Subversive number 81. As always, I'm your host, Justin O'Donnell, and before we get started, just remember, whatever platform you listen on, whether it's YouTube, Live, Odyssey, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, or on the air at LRN.FM, you can help grow the show by liking, commenting, subscribing, and sharing with your friends. If you enjoy the content, you can join our insurgency by visiting patreon.com slash O'Donnell. Again, that's patreon.com slash O'Donnell. And make sure to check out snackswag.com, our sponsor, for all your favorite subversive merch, including some brand new designs for you know, t-shirts, hoodies, coffee mugs, and more. Again, that's snackswag.com, where you can check out and get all your favorite Liberty merch to wear your principles, literally on your sleeve so check it out today give them a visit links in the link tree in the description on whatever video or podcast you're listening to now if you want to keep in touch between shows follow me on social media and join our community discord channel uh, where you can chat with other fans of the show at any time all these links can be found in the link tree in the description of the video or podcast you're listening to so make sure you check them out today now Today, I want to have a chat about the fact that libertarians, anarchists, conservatives, and all manner and stripe of political activists and policy wonks have been losing the culture war in some of the simplest battlegrounds in the conversations we have with those in our lives. Now, when I got out of the army, not knowing what to do, not wanting to work for the government any longer, thanks to my newly recognized libertarian principles, I hung on my college degrees in emergency management and homeland security and pursued a career in sales. I really had a niche, a knack for it. Found my niche, founding success in both business to business and business to consumer direct sales. I learned a lot about how to turn my natural knack for talking to people into a tool for communication and sales. A couple of years ago, I wrote a book, uh, Selling Liberty, Communicating Freedom in an Unfree World, where I tried to translate some of the basic skills of sales uh, to be helpful for a newfound political activist trying to sell their ideas. Because, yes, What we're doing is, in fact, selling something. And we're selling something most people don't want, something they don't believe in, something they don't value. But for our own sake, for our own safety, our health, our well-being, our freedom, and our liberty, we need them to start buying. This is my first crack at writing in over a decade. And here I am now, 3,500 words a week regularly later. But it's high time I think it got a revisiting. And tonight... I want to touch on just one subject that I covered in that book. Ladies and gentlemen, selling liberty, the 10 steps to having a better conversation. Now, 10 steps to having a better conversation. A lot of you are going to ask, why do we need to have better conversations? And that's where we need to start by recognizing the problem. Okay. Now, libertarians as a whole, we have a touch of the tism, and one of the hardest things we do in everyday life is simply having conversations. Sure, we talk to plenty of people as we go about our business, but in the age of automation, that's becoming easier and easier and easier to avoid. Many of us, myself included, go out of our way to use self-checkouts just to avoid having to talk to another human being, make minimum wage behind the counter. Escaping conversations isn't the true issue at hand, but rather our inability to have those conversations when we want to. Never mind when we need to. Without the ability to have a conversation, we can't effectively communicate our ideas. And without that, our battle is lost. Many of us believe that this issue is not something we need to work on. We've worked out reach booths. We've done petition drives. We've canvassed. We've door knocked for candidates. Surely we're comfortable talking to people. But our experience gives us false confidence. We've become teachers, not salesmen. 
And that's just the problem. Talking to people is the skill of a teacher, not of a salesman. We aren't doing things just to check off the list and move on to the next task. This isn't public school. If we're going to grow the movement and succeed at our tasks, then first things first, we need to learn to stop talking to people and talking at them and start having conversations with them instead. What we're going to discuss tonight in this uh, chapter, in this presentation, is the ability to have a conversation and some tips and tricks to make those conversations better. The skills are not inherently specific to the nature of political activism. A lot of them can be used in your everyday life to just improve the conversations you have with your friends and your family and those you care about. But social media has really softened our communication skills and made us inept at personal connection. Facebook, texting, and other technologies provide us immense opportunities to have impersonal communication. There's nothing more powerful than a face-to-face -face conversation as a tool to connect with someone, but we're stuck behind screens. And whether that someone is a voter, a volunteer, a friend, a colleague, a sibling, an in-law, the importance of communicating your ideas and listening to theirs is important. Building rapport, having these conversations is one of the fundamental cores of success in business and in life. And with these skills, you'll be able to converse confidently, freely, independently, all while maintaining control of the conversations you have. And now that we know the problem, recognize the problem and what we're working towards, let's get in to the 10 steps to having better conversations. Step one, stop talking and listen. I know that's hard for a lot of people. How can you have a better conversation if you're not talking? Well, controlling a conversation isn't necessarily communication. The first step in improving your conversational skills is quite simply the easiest. Shut up. Stop talking. This may be the easiest to grasp. It's honestly the hardest to put into practice. I struggle with it myself. If you couldn't tell, I like to talk. It's a very basic human instinct to want to control a conversation. And many of us fall into the traps of believing that if we're talking, then we're in control. When we are talking, we aren't listening. We may be controlling the flow of a conversation, but we have no idea of its impact. And it's crucial that more than we talk, we listen. And we don't listen just to hear, but we listen to listen and understand. Buddha said a dog is not considered a good dog because he's a good baker. A man is not considered a good man because he's a good talker. This gets to the core of conversational skills. And think about it from personal experience. We've all been in situations where we couldn't get in a word edgewise and felt unfulfilled by the conversations we were having. But by speaking as little as necessary and actively and intently listening to those that we speak to, we can choose to have a more profound impact on the tone of the conversation when we do choose to speak. And you're listening to understand, not just to hear. Something that's often overlooked and often forgotten when it comes to listening skills is the reason you're listening. We don't want to get into the trap of listening with the intent of responding. We aren't in this simply to win an argument. The reason we need to listen to those we're conversing with is to understand them. When we listen to understand, we don't just hear what they said, but why they think that, why they came to that conclusion, what the underlying problem is, the need beneath the need. When we do respond, we can do so from a position of understanding and empathy as opposed to combative debate and argumentation. Once we reach a level of understanding that can empathize with the points being made to us, we can craft a response that respects those feelings, acknowledges them, and encourages informed thought, which is ultimately the goal of any conversation, to think. Now, step two, pay attention fully. Don't be distracted. And everyone knows what it's like to try and talk to someone while they're checking their tasks their Facebook notifications, their Twitter timeline. Multitasking not only distracts from the conversation you're having, but it's just downright disrespectful. If you're going to have a conversation with someone, have the conversation with them. Don't allow yourself to be distracted by everything else that's not happening in the moment. Don't worry. Facebook's going to be there when you're done. Twitter timeline will keep ringing. 
and your notifications won't go away. Be in the moment. It's not just your phones and your electronics that distract you and distract us. To be honest, it's your life. When someone's speaking to you, don't just put down the phone, but focus on the person you're with, not on the argument you had with your boss or uh, your argument with your wife about what's for dinner. Or It doesn't matter what you're going to have. And sure as hell doesn't matter whether or not someone like just liked your most recent Instagram post. When you're engaged in a conversation, understand why you're engaged in it and commit to it. You're there for a reason. So be present in the circumstance and dedicate yourself to the task at hand. If you don't want to be in that conversation, that's okay. Leave. By all means, find an opportunity to leave the conversation. Excuse yourself for something that's inherently more important. But definitely don't have to be there. Engaging in a conversation is a task in and of itself. And if you're not enjoying the task, you shouldn't be doing it. We all, we've all we all been guilty of this, myself included. But give it a try, and you'll realize how much more you'll enjoy the people you have conversations with when you allow yourself to listen to them without the distractions and mindless scrolling through your newsfeed. Because a conversation at its heart requires more than just giving someone your attention, but giving them your undivided attention and participating fully. Step three for all you evangelists, preachers, ministers, and teachers. Stop it. (laughs) A conversation isn't the place for your soliloquy. You're not here to preach. You're not here to give a sermon. Another of the most common mistakes we make is the tendency to pontificate endlessly without any opportunity for interjection. Worse, even than not being listened to, is being talked at. Lecturing someone is not having a conversation rather than reinforcing your desire to hear yourself talk. Now, sometimes we need to vent. Sometimes there's something you just need to get off your chest, and you don't quite care what the other person has to say about it. In that case, let's not uh, confuse ourselves into believing that we're having a conversation because we're far from it. This isn't a therapy session. It never should be. There's nothing inherently wrong with utilizing venting and therapy and commiserating, so long as it's not your primary conversational style, because when you're preaching at someone, it's generally hostile and combative, regardless of the intent of the speaker. And yes, I mean you, Christianity. Now, no one wants to be spoken to and preached to without the possibility of coming to healthy points and an exchange of ideas. Sometimes we need to set aside our personal opinions and enter each conversation assuming that we have something to learn. Expect to give opportunities for pushback in responses and arguments, or else you're just going to stifle the conversation and limit your own ability to teach anything and limit your own ability to grow or learn anything. If those aren't things you can accept, then don't have a conversation. Go write a blog instead. Now, step four is to make sure you ask the right questions. Okay. Now, how many times have you been working an outreach booth, knocking on doors while canvassing, or tried talking to customers and been roadblocked by yes and no one-word answers? When I first started, it was the most frustrating thing I ever dealt with. You've made fantastic points. You drove your message hard. You made your pitch. You asked the question. You went for the close. But the prospect replies with just a yes or a no, the one-worded response. Your questions were too complicated. Ask the open-ended questions. When you present someone with a complicated open-ended question, they'll give you the simplest answer that, uh, they can. When you ask them with a simple open-ended question, they'll be excited to answer it. And while that may very well have answered your question with the simplest answer, it didn't give you anything to follow up with to keep the conversation going any longer. Open-ended questions will allow you to get the person you're speaking with to provide you with information that will help guide the conversation for the rest of the night. Now, so take that information, learn from it, and enjoy your time with it. The skill does inherently build upon 
open listening, active listening, and other discuss skills of listening rather than talking and avoiding your tendency to preach. But it will fundamentally change how people will talk to you based on what you've asked them. When we look at this from a perspective of political outreach or even sales, uh, the idea is you don't want to tell the prospect why you're right. You want to get them to come to the conclusion on their own by following a logical progression. We can do this by building on what was previously asked and asking simple questions that get complex answers, like ask them what it was like or how did it feel, and let them describe to you a situation rather than telling you the yes or no answer. Rather than explaining it to them, let them explain it to you. When someone is self-guided rather than taught, the inevitable conclusion is a self-realization rather than confrontation. Yeah, we do want to challenge their ideas. That's really the whole reason we're here. Um, we want to challenge our ideas and their preconceptions and their political beliefs and their ethical beliefs. But before they can embrace ours, they must first question their own. <laughs> the most control you're ever going to have in a conversation is when you ask a simple question. And it's open-ended enough to get a complex answer and a thorough and complete answer that provides you with new information. When the other person has to pause and think about how to respond, they're busy thinking and they're questioning whether or not their opinion holds weight. Let's be honest, it's far more interesting to get a, a complex response than a simple yes or no. And if nothing else, it makes your conversation more enjoyable. And step five, never get sidetracked. No side quests. There's a lot of video gamers in the liberty movement and political movements, people who love role-playing games, tabletop RPGs, and we've all been in a situation where we've gotten a side quest, whether in Fallout or Skyrim or in your latest D&D &D quest where somebody sent you off the rails, your DM was pissed, and but you let the hobo in the bar send you up a mountain to find some gold. You forgot what the mission was, you forgot what you were working on, and you're wandering the wastelands around Vegas and Fallout with Vegas and don't know what to do. We've all been there. You sit with a friend, you're having a great conversation, and then you remember something funny that happened last week, and you just have to share it. Don't. It doesn't matter how great or how interesting your story is. Don't interrupt someone else. And even worse, when someone else is speaking, don't wait around impatiently for them to finish just so you can change the subject. Stay relevant. Stay on topic, and interjection isn't a bad thing in its own right. You can interject if you're short. Don't derail the speaker and help reinforce the point of the person talking. But don't forget to listen and give others space to tell their story. But when we move conversations off track to relate to our anecdote without responding to what was said, it signals to others that we either weren't listening to begin with or we didn't care about what they had to say. When you lose the trust of the person you're talking to, you've lost a conversation. You're no longer on equal footing. So just know that not everything needs to be said and focus on what is being said. And when thoughts come into your mind, just let them freely leave. Let them bounce and scatter on because if they weren't relevant, then they didn't matter. Remember, we're listening not to respond, but to understand. And if we focus on our contribution to the conversation, then we can't fully understand the points that others are bringing to us. Now, knowing what you know and knowing what you don't are some of the most important things. If a conversation exceeds your knowledge base, knowledge based and do not pretend to be an expert acknowledge the limits of your expertise and relinquish the question for further investigation there's nothing worse than losing your credibility because you try and bluff your way through an argument of the fact you sound like a used car salesman who's desperate for a close however in admitting that you don't know something you often endear yourself to the prospect or to the conversational partner you might not have the answer offhand, but at least you're not pretending to. At least you're acknowledging the equal footing that you're on. But commit to finding out. If you don't know the answer, if you're not an expert, become one. There's a funny story I have about this from my time in the Army. 
It's always stuck with me, and I'll never forget it. But a young soldier, a little bit younger than me, and we were going through a promotion board roughly the same time. The months leading up to this promotion board, we were drilled relentlessly um, with questions regarding military history, customs, traditions, job-based knowledge, and our senior drill sergeants and uh, NCOs prepping us and drilling us rigorously and relentlessly for months before this board. And one of the things they drilled into us the hardest was that confidence mattered more than being right. If you're unsure of a question, just answer it confidently and move on to the next. Even if you were wrong. <laughs> I did that. Stuck to it. Knew my... Just answered the first thing that came to gut every question moved on. However... One kid didn't, this other soldier. He paused, faltered, couldn't come up with the answer on the spot, but he answered. He did answer confidently. I apologize, sir, but I do not know the answer at this time. However, I shall research it and return with an answer as soon as possible. <laughs> Later that day, we all left. He hung around. He sat outside the boardroom for three hours until the promotion board convened and uh, came out for the day and Brought himself to attention to greet the officers leaving the boardroom. He provided them the answer to the question he didn't know previously. Two weeks later, he was promoted. I wasn't. Honesty is always the best policy when you're dealing with those difficult situations. If you don't know something, simply say that you don't know it. If you're caught in a lie, it's going to destroy the trust and cohesion of the conversation that you're trying to have. And when you're trying to convince someone to join your cause, the last thing you want to do is look stupid or lose their trust. Step seven, know what you've already said. Don't repeat yourself. Repetition is great for memorization, but it kills the conversation. And frankly, it's boring. Repeating a point you've already made gives the impression that you aren't focused on the shared aspect of the conversation. You simply want to drive your point home as deep as possible. You want to drill it in. You want to hammer it in. Blunt force to make your point. Seriously, how self-centered do you have to be to forget what you already said? And it doesn't matter how many times you rephrase it. If you're making the same point, trust me, they get it. And generally, they feel as if you're talking down to them after hearing it so many times. The conversation is a back and forth, an exchange, and an evolution of ideas. When you constantly repeat yourself, you aren't having a conversation anymore. You're just setting yourself up to argue. And no matter what you think on Facebook threads, nobody ever wins an argument. And often... People ask, why is repetition so harmful to conversations? And while I'm no child psychologist, I have noticed a trend in parenting. We use repetition to teach and train children and dogs on proper conduct to temper their actions. Perhaps there's something to the notion that constantly repeating yourself has a negative connotation where people feel they're being talked down to as a child would be. But just because you have that point to make doesn't mean... You need to repeat it a hundred times. Maybe the problem is you weren't making it correctly or in a acceptable or achievable or understandable manner to begin with. So if you couldn't deliver it properly in the first place, repeating it time and time again won't be likely to make it easier. The details never matter. <laughs> Minutia is a distraction. You know all those minute details you drag up to draw out your point? You try and think it's going to make it more impactful because you know what date Frederick Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom or you know what battle happened on what Tuesday in 1784. Or... When reality, nobody gives a shit. Nobody cares. When you're having a conversation with somebody, they're interested in you and what you have to say, not the minutia of history. Save the trivia for the bar. When you spend too much time qualifying the points you've made by spouting what amounts to trivia, the point itself is lost in the drivel. Now, this isn't to say that you shouldn't include any facts to support your argument, but you need to know which facts suit the conversation, are relevant to the conversation, benefit the conversation, and improve the conversation. 
And which ones are just there to prove that you're the smartest person in the room? Which, by the way, you aren't. And never will be. So remember, when you're about to spout that name, the date, or other trivial detail where it's not needed, adding these trivial points and details to a conversation is only worthwhile if they serve to better your understanding of your listener and your listener's understanding of your point, as opposed to your peace of mind. Remember why you're there. It's not to educate, it's to learn and to help them learn in response. Be succinct, be clear, be thorough, but never over-educate. One of the most difficult is recognizing that your experiences are not the same. And people complain, it's what they do. Whenever you're talking to someone, rather, whether having a serious conversation or just a passing quip or chat in the hallway at the water bubbler chat or gossip, there's a chance there's something they have to complain about. Now, sometimes these complaints are just for the sake of complaining. But usually they're going to relate to an experience that left a negative impact on them. And I'm going to be extraordinarily blunt here. Their experiences are different than yours. And nothing has happened to you that is equal to or the same as to what happened to them. When they talk about having a bad day at work, you don't tell them how much you hate your job. If they just lost a family member, you don't talk about a recent loss of your own. It's never about you. And by equating your experiences, their experiences with your own, you're not building rapport. You're not finding common ground. Quite the opposite. What you're doing is minimizing the experiences that they've had and denying them the importance of their individual experience. And this is one of the quickest ways to turn somebody off from paying attention to you. And I know this is hard because a lot of people tell you that when somebody's struggling or going through something hard or complaining, it's best to empathize with them and show that you understand. But this is more something that really autistic people do. You just try and relate. You don't understand. You just tell them that you do. And you try and show them that you do by saying you've gone through the same thing. It's not that bad. We've all been through it. But it minimizes the individuality of each person in the experience. There's many ways to use the conversation to build rapport and this is quite possibly one of the most dismissive and harmful attempts possible. Even when you experience an event with somebody alongside them as partners or whatever, it's a shared experience, the impact of that experience can vary greatly between individuals. And while commiseration and therapy sessions and venting and talking about those experiences is oftentimes helpful, it's incredibly important to remember that they're distinct and different and to not minimize the impact they've had on each individual. So what's most important to remember here when it comes to your impact on a conversation is that it's never about you. Step 10 is brevity, possibly the most important. Of all the steps I've mentioned so far, this one may be the most important. Keeping things short, (coughs) keeping things brief, concise, and to the point. A great conversation doesn't drone on. You can say a lot in a brief time. Especially if you listen and understand where others are coming from. If you drag it out too long, interest will fade. The opportunity presented will be wasted. Leave people with your ideas fresh in their heads and not overwhelmed. If you conveyed your points accurately and appropriately, you'll get another shot at another conversation with a foundation of trust and experience. When they come back to you, know when it's appropriate to end that conversation. A good conversation is like a miniskirt. It's long enough to cover the subject, but short enough to keep everyone's attention. So now what? So far, we've discussed 10 steps to improve a single aspect of our outreach and conversational skills. We went over a lot, and these aren't the easiest changes to make. But they aren't just applicable in political outreach. These steps can help improve the conversations you have in your everyday life as well. 
Now, what I want you to do, what I want us ought to do, what I want everyone to do is to pick one of these steps. It doesn't matter which one. It might matter which one. I recommend starting in the beginning and make that change right away. And when you see your everyday conversational enjoyment and productivity improving, add another piece to that puzzle. Now, we're not done by a long shot. We haven't discussed sales tactics, how to sell your ideas, but the ability to have a conversation is paramount before you can start directing the nature and content of those conversations. So practice every day. Start with your family dinner. Put the phones away. Listen to each other. Understand how everyone felt about their day. Avoid changing the subject. Avoid hostile and controlling communication styles. But above all, enjoy the conversations you're having. Now, this and other topics and other skills and other advice for how to sell liberty is available in my book, Selling Liberty, Communicating Freedom in an Unfree World. It's available on Amazon. The link is in the description of this video or podcast that you listen to if you want to grab it. And I'm going to read you this review. It's not my words. I did not write this. Someone on Amazon did, but exactly what every libertarian needs to read right now. O'Donnell's style is conversational and completely unintimidating, thus modeling the style we libertarians need to adopt in public. Selling liberty addresses the problems which we all know we have in the liberty movement, which is putting a human face on a group of rebels who most of the population have been taught to fear. I appreciate those words. I believe in those words. I love those words. Thank you so much for whoever wrote them, the anonymous Amazon review. And thank you so much for tuning in, guys. And this was a shorter talk than normal. But remember, point 10 was brevity. The point here was to be quick, concise, thorough, complete, not distracted by unnecessary details, not to overwhelm with information. This was a tool. This was a step forward. Watch it a couple times. Listen to it. Check out the Substack tomorrow. Leave a like. Leave a comment. Share this with a friend who you think needs to hear it. Now, and once again, a shout out to our patrons, the people who support this show and support this program, Stephanie Kinsella, Jeremy Slotcha, Mike Dalgleish, Jeremy Kaufman, Robert Daniel, Josh Richard, and Antonio Spaghetti on our top tiers. You can join them and the insurrection at patreon.com slash O'Donnell today. If you want to help, make sure you give it a visit. Pop in $3 a month bottom tier 40 at the top but you know where you can land you can help keep things going and keep things moving head on over to our Substack link also in the description where you can get our newsletter every single week the program's growing the show is growing the brand is growing why don't you grow along with us and that's all for this time guys it's been quick it's been brief it's been fun until next time stay free Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Subversive. Make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications to get alerted every time we go live on YouTube. And make sure to leave some comments and reviews on whatever platform you listen on. Let me know what you thought of this episode. And a huge thanks and shout out to our sponsors and the awesome members of the Insurgency on Patreon. If you enjoyed this content, you can join the Insurgency on Patreon by following the links in the description for patreon.com slash O'Donnell. And if you can't catch the show live, you can always catch it the next day on YouTube, Odyssey, Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, CastBox, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts every day. So until next time, everybody, be free.